Welcome everyone to today's presentation about plant functional traits presented by Brandon Allen. Brandon is an applied ecologist with the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute. His current focus is on the reporting and development of biodiversity and landscape-based indicators for regional planning initiatives. Indicator development is a collaborative process that includes multiple stakeholders within the government of Alberta. Technical documentation, case studies, and open discussion between all stakeholders is required for the development of scientifically defensible indicators. Brandon's research focus is varied, ranging from the genetic consequences of harvest in Alberta's walleye fishery and the distribution of hybridization in the threatened West Slope cutthroat trout, all the way to investigating the relationships between invasion, land cover, and water chemistry in wetland vascular plant assemblages. Brandon completed his BSc in ecology and an MSc in evolutionary biology from the University of Calgary. So with that, take it away, Brandon. So one of the things that um, is happening to wetlands, not just in Alberta, but worldwide, is that they are experiencing a wide range of ecological pressures. So we have issues such as climate change that are happening. Um, so changing precipitation patterns and temperature of regimes, um, they are going to influence the dynamic. or agriculture or any other type of land use um, activity. There's also some more complex issues affecting wetlands, so things such as eutroph eutrophication. So this is just a scenario where nutrients are being dumped into these wetland systems. They become extremely productive. Um, tons of vegetation is grown, and eventually they kind of just grow themselves out of being a wetland. Um, and this can happen due to um, fertilizer runoff and have lots of other um, kind of surrounding ecosystem impacts. And lastly, we have invasive species. This is a big topic um, that affects wetlands in lots of different ways. Uh, today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about terrestrial invaders, but uh, I think a lot of us know that we have issues with species such as flowering rush that like to invade water bodies and wetlands. There's always the news story every year about um, carps that seem to be invading wetlands or even people releasing the goldfish. So there's no shortage of pressures that wetlands are currently facing right now. Now, in Alberta, we have five different classes of wetlands. Um, for those that just like to go out and just kind of passively enjoy nature, a lot of these wetlands would look very similar to one another. But once you dig into the details, there are really unique differences. Um, so some of these wetlands are really driven by the amount of peat that they have or how they get their groundwater or lack of groundwater in some cases. Um, some of them are based on the permanency. So, you know, are they having this open water system that kind of fluctuates and ebbs and flows over time? And they all have differences in I'm just going to unmute myself there. Um, so one of the things um, that's interesting about these communities is that we can try and uh, figure out some of the functions and underlying processes that are going on in these wetlands. So why study communities? Um, so there is no shortage of scales that we can study the environment at. Um, for those that are really interested in broad scale patterns, we can look at the biosphere or the biomes, all the way down to individual organisms. Um, if they're wanting to understand you know, how chemicals affect maybe the breeding success of amphibians. And there's no right or wrong scale to study the environment at. Um, I personally just think the community is kind of an interesting balance where we're looking at a large um, breadth of species and we're looking at how they're interacting with each other and how they um, together make or complement um, the habitat that exists on the landscape. So how do we understand these communities? Um, it's really easy if we're looking at, you know, organisms and species, what we mean by studying them, but the communities can be a bit challenging. Um, so there's usually kind of three different ways that we look at a community. One is just the species. Um, so we might have two wetlands, uh, maybe one is a fen, one is a bog, and they might have very different species. Um, so that is just a very simple way to understand that, you know, the community of a fen is different than a community of a bog. However, we can get into some more nuanced things, such as the abundance of these species. So maybe we have a wetland or two wetlands that have a, the same set of species at present. However, maybe their abundances are drastically different. Maybe we have one that is you know, lots of native species. They're all kind of in the same abundance as each other. And we have another one, it's the same species, but maybe it's dominated by flower and rush, or maybe it's dominated by cattails. 
And this might tell us maybe that something like underlying in this community is happening. Maybe there's a change to how nutrients are flowing into the system. Maybe there's surrounding disturbance that's impacting these species. Um, so we can get some, some really interesting nuance that um, even though the same species are present, their abundances are telling us something different. And lastly, and this is kind of the main focus of today's webinar, um, we can look at traits. Um, so what do I mean by traits? Um, sometimes they're referred to as functional traits, but these are um, aspects of plants or animals that kind of relate to the underlying um, functions that um, the species need to survive. So when we're thinking of plants specifically, we might look at things such as leaf area. So we can all go outside, we can look at a bunch of plants and realize that they all have different sizes of leaves. And this directly late, relates back to um, how easily that they can acquire resources from the environment. So if you have bigger leaves or more leaves, you can photosynthesize at a different rate compared to one with smaller leaves or fewer leaves. And this might also influence, you know, where do you fall in that community? So are you a tree with lots of leaves and um, big leaves, or are you a tiny shrub that needs to be in the shade? Are you a grass that's just kind of tucked in somewhere within the community that doesn't maybe need as much sunlight? Um, but again, all of these traits are telling us something really unique about the environment um, and how these species kind of fit in and complement each other. And you can even go to some of these like really interesting extremes where um, maybe a plant doesn't really need leaves as much, but maybe it is carnivorous and it's relying on um, insects to actually get its nutrients. And so this is just a very small set of traits um, here, at, but there's no shortage of fun and interesting traits that we can begin to look at. So within this kind of larger context of communities and the traits that these communities have, um, we had two objectives for our, for our study in the paper that we published. So the first was that we just really want to understand what is the influence of the surrounding environment on the diversity of those traits, um, as well as how uh, the degree of invasion intensity in those wetlands. And secondly, we wanted to understand how those ecological traits are linked directly to the environmental factors. So instead of these broad scale diversity measures, which I'll go into in a little bit later, uh, we wanted to know these exact specific patterns. So are plants growing taller if there's more or less agriculture around the wetlands? Do we see fewer invasive species if it's dominated by native fens versus upland deciduous forest? Um, so it's really kind of figuring out the nitty gritty details of how these traits are really linked to the environment. So to this, um, our study system was the boreal forest. Um, as Brett mentioned, the ABMI does a lot of large-scale biodiversity monitoring, so um, this is only a subset of the sites that was available to us to use, but we ended up finding 143 boreal wetlands um, that were surveyed uh, within, a, I think it was a five-year period. And these wetlands were chosen uh, for a very specific reason. The first was that we just needed to find wetlands um, that had no invasive species present. So we used the invasive species list um, provided by the government of Alberta, so like the weed and noxious lists. And we we're able to find a subset of them that had no invasive terrestrial invaders, um, which I think is great. It's nice to know that there are a lot of wetlands out there um, that aren't impacted by invasive species. And to complement that, uh, we found almost the same number of wetlands that had terrestrial invaders um, occurring in the system. So for us, we ended up choosing Canada thistle and perennial sow thistle. Um, these two species um, have similar kind of invasive properties by invading the upland systems. Um, so we thought that this was a good proxy of um, understanding the invasion pressure, invasion uh, amount on these wetlands. And again, they're a species that is very important for management purposes as well. So they are legislated species and we are actively trying to manage their uh, impacts on the environment. So had a, a few reasons for picking these two invaders. So at each of those 153 wetlands, uh, we collected a ton of data. So first was we collected all of the uh, plant data. So these were our seasonal texts that went out um, and did a bunch of transects at all of these wetlands to collect um, the, both the abundance and just the species identity at these wetlands. We calculated a bunch of regional climate information. So, you know, understanding the amount of precipitation, the temperature, the frost free period at all of these wetlands. We summarized the local habitat. Um, when I'm talking about local habitat, I mean kind of terrestrial land cover. 
So this included knowing, you know, the proportion of black spruce or fens or deciduous forests um, that were surrounding all of these wetlands that we surveyed. Um, but we also did include uh, different types of footprints. So the, the main types of footprint um, within this kind of study system were agriculture and urban industrial. Um, but there were other footprint types, um, such as seismic lines that were, were there as well. But they just uh, ended up being kind of a much smaller, uh, having much smaller impact than these two types of footprint. And lastly was water chemistry. So again, wetlands are really interesting. Their water chemistry can tell you a lot. Um, so we grabbed some of the, the fairly common types of water chemistry variables, the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus within the system, um, salinity. But we also were able to get isotope information as well. So this isotope information helps tell us a little bit about the wetlands um, and know like, is it getting water from an overgr or overground um, source? So is it just precipitation that is feeding into the system? Um, or is it a relatively stable wetland where it's getting a lot of groundwater supply every year um, and the actual borders of the wetland aren't growing or shrinking from a year to year basis? So again, we got a ton of basketball plant surveys. We have a ton of environmental data. And on top of that, we had to compile a bunch of data on the functional traits. Um, so as I mentioned before, there's no shortage of functional traits that we can use, but we went to the literature and kind of grabbed a set of traits that um, have known linkages to the environment. So we grabbed traits that were related to competitive ability. So as I mentioned, leaf area is a great um, indicator of competitive ability. If you can photosynthesize more light, you might be more competitive compared to another tree that has much smaller leaves. We also grabbed a bunch of traits on dispersal and establishment. So in this case, it was meat and seed weight. And this is, a, again, a great trait. So if you're a, a plant, you might choose to have few very large seeds that might be more successful um, at establishing, or you might have thousands of really small seeds and better able to disperse. Um, and this is, again, going to influence the types of communities that can grow and succeed in these areas. We've got a few traits um, talking about the response to disturbance. I think a lot of people um, in their gardens and myself, I am currently dealing with dandelions. Um, they are quite resilient to disturbance, uh, try as you might. Um, but there is a gradient of how species tend to respond. They can be really resilient to these disturbances. They can handle other environmental stresses like, nu like poor nutrients. Um, maybe they're really good at colonizing new habitat once it becomes available. So we've got a whole suite of traits uh, related to how they respond to these disturbances. And lastly, we got something um, that looks at their affinity to occupy wetland. Uh, so for those that are really into the wetland world, um, we looked at their what's known as their hydrophyte status. So this is really just, um, does the plant species need to be within a wetland in order to um, survive and thrive? So we might get species, you know, like a, um, like black spruce that, you know, it, does, it doesn't want to be in the water. It's kind of near and around the wetland. We wouldn't call it a hydrophyte. And other ones um, like lily pads, like they just need to be in the water. That needs to exist. Um, otherwise they aren't going to thrive. So again, just to reiterate, so we wanted to try and understand two components of this. We wanted to understand first the trade environment relationships to just try and uh, help kind of solidify this in your mind. We can pick a single trait. So in this case, this figure just shows the maximum height of, a, of any species. Um, and we were able to analyze the relationships with all of these environmental variables. So in this case, we can think about the proportion of agriculture. So if you are actively farming an area, it's very likely to be a monoculture or it might have a few different types of valuable crops. It's not going to have a wide range of you know, grasses and forbs and shrubs and trees. It's really going to be whatever crop um, you plan on growing that year. And so you might see a relationship where when you look at the height of the species within that community, um, as you uh, increase the amount of agriculture without a wetland, we might see the maximum height decreasing. And this was done for all of these environment and trait relationships. So it gets quite complex in understanding, you know, maybe the height is decreasing, but maybe they're more stress tolerant. Maybe on top of that, they're increasing their dispersal ability. So you get this really interesting web of uh, interactions occurring in these trait environment relationships. The second component, which I talked about, was these um, kind of components of functional diversity. So often, I think a lot of people understand the idea of species diversity. So uh, species richness is really common 
biodiversity indicator that's out there. And it's really just understanding you know, the number of unique species within an environment. And we can do exactly the same thing, but from the function or from the perspective of a trait. So in this case, let's say our trait is, you know, is it a um, the growth type? So we're going to talk about is it a grass or a forb? Is it a shrub or is it a tree? And if we look at richness, um, if we look at the top figure, we can see that yeah, it's a relatively rich habitat. There's you know the three different types of growth forms, and maybe some wetlands might be able to support all three types. Other ones might not be able to support as many. Um, but again, it gives us an indication of how many types of um, traits are present within that environment. The next kind of component of functional diversity we can dig into is what's called as evenness. So this is, again, much more similar to the abundance measure that I talked about previously. So it's instead of knowing, you know, we might have the same species with the same amount of richness um, for a trait in an environment but the distribution of those traits might be very different. So we might have um, in the figure in the bottom left here, a relatively even um, distribution of the trait. We have one species that is a grass, one is a shrub, one is a tree. Um, but we might get something very different. Maybe it is dominated by grasses or maybe it's dominated by shrubs or by trees. And this is gonna tell us something very different again from the fact that maybe you have the same number of species or you have the same number of traits um, within that environment but their distribution varies among the wetlands. And lastly, and I want to talk about this a little bit, is divergence. Um, so this is kind of the last common way we view functional diversity. And this is just kind of looking at the extremes of those traits that we're interested in. Um, so compared to the richness figure, where we have you know, a relatively even number of different um, growth types, divergence is saying, what if we only have the extremes? So what if we only have grasses? And what if we only have trees um, within this wetland? And again, that's telling us something very different um, compared to a wetland that maybe has, again, an equal number of them, or maybe it only has one of those traits versus kind of these um, polar opposite ends of the, of the trait of interest. So like digging into some of the results, um, one of the really important things is that we looked at these wetlands um, and we looked at species richness. So again, just the number of unique species at these wetlands. Um, and when we group them by invasion status, there was no difference. Um, it doesn't really matter if a wetland had the presence of an invasive species or not. The number of species present at those wetlands just didn't matter. Um, so this is kind of an interesting result that if we kind of viewed it from um, the lens without species traits, um, we might say at the end of the day, invasion doesn't matter. Um, we see the same number of species at invaded wetlands versus uninvaded. End of story, uh, move on kind of thing. The other things that we found, so like wetlands that we surveyed, they were you know, primarily surrounded by lowland coniferous and other marsh fen bog type habitats. And surprisingly, cultivation um, and urban industrial were the, the main drivers of disturbance in the landscape. Um, it was interesting to see just where cultivation was occurring, but most of that is just kind of the fringes of just north of the parkland areas that we saw a, a bit of cultivation happening around these wetlands. So as I said, it didn't seem to matter when we looked at species richness, um, how it varied between invasion, but once we dig into these functional traits, it definitely did matter. Um, so I'm only going to talk about two components of functional diversity that I mentioned. Um, the first is what we're going to call relative hydrophyte richness. So this is uh, very similar to the functional richness that I just talked about, but in this case, we're just looking at the proportion of hydrophytes relative to the proportion of non-hydrophytes within the system. So, you know, wetlands with lots of hydrophytes um, might be different than species or wetlands without many hydrophytes. And that definitely uh, plays out. So in this case, um, when we look at the, Im or the impacts of invasion on relative hydrophyte richness, um, we can see that wetlands had much higher uh, rates of invasion if they had fewer um, or proportionally fewer hydrophytes present. So again, it's not that it was more or less, it was just that relative proportion. So if it's a, a wetland dominated by hydrophytes, um, it was much less likely to be invaded by these terrestrial um, invaders of perennial thistle and Canada thistle. And we see some also some other interesting kind of patterns. So, you know, if the wetland was surrounded by lowland coniferous forest, other wetland habitats um, and pine forests, um, we we're much likely to see an increase in the amount of um, proportionally the increased richness of hydrophytes. And the one that I want you to focus on too is this um, Delta 18O. So this is the stable uh, 
isotope of oxygen that we looked at. So where I told you it was really looking at the hydrology of the system. And what this means here is that having an increased amount of this isotope uh, means that we have kind of a more fluctuating hydrology happening. So that's a, that emergent zone is probably increasing and decreasing over the year or throughout years. Um, and that presence of that kind of unstable um, system is, I think, allowing for more hydrophytes to flourish because they get kind of this temporary habitat, but it's also excluding terrestrial invaders from colonizing because they're getting flooded out on those yearly bases, even if they try and get in there. Kind of looking at a different aspect of functional diversity, um, we look at evenness. So again, this is, you know, how, how are these traits distributed and are they kind of, you know, the same number of species or the same amount of those traits present within these wetlands? Um, we see a different pattern. So wetlands that had higher levels in, of invasion had a higher evenness. So the traits within these wetlands were more evenly distributed. Um, again, this kind of relates back to the, the hydrophate richness. So if we have a more even distribution of uh, traits in the landscape, um, that means that there isn't a bias towards hydrophytes. And so maybe it's much easier for these uh, terrestrial invaders to colonize. Again, looking at this um, delta 18 of oxygen, so this isotope, um, we see, again, the opposite relationship. So in this case, um, I, the low value of this isotope means that there's a relatively stable hydrology. So these are wetlands that have relatively stable borders. Um, and maybe, again, that's allowing the terrestrial invaders to colonize that upland habitat that stays relatively dry um, and isn't kind of being seasonally impacted by changes in water flow. Again, I, I think this is... To me, this is really cool and interesting stuff. Um, but again, when we looked at species richness, we see nothing, but we dig into these functional traits and we see lots of cool patterns. Digging into the specific trait relationships, uh, we get even, I think, even more exciting results. So this figure here um, is just showing this really complex matrix I told you about comparing the surrounding habitat with the climate, with the water chemistry and the functional traits, all with the invasion status into a single plot. So uh, you can view it as each of these points represents a wetland. The points in orange are wetlands that have an invasive species present, and the ones with the green squares don't have any invasive species present. Um, and as you can see, there's like a fairly clear clustering of the two types of wetlands. And in general, the types of traits and environment associated with those wetlands are different. So uninvaded wetlands generally, or generally have species that um, are stress tolerant, more likely to be hydrophytes um, or have shrubs. They are surrounded by, again, pine, lowland coniferous, and wetland habitats. And this is, again, opposite to these invaded wetlands, the ones that have lots of invasive species. There's fewer hydrophytes present. It's surrounded by upland uh, deciduous forests, urban industrial cultivation, um, and even have uh, increased amounts of nutrification that's happening. So again, when we kind of looked at the differences between invaded and uninvaded wetlands from that you know, species richness standpoint, we see nothing. But again, once you dig into the traits in the environment, um, we see what we think is a fairly clear pattern that um, the traits present and the species present at these wetlands is different uh, depending on the invasion status. So uh, one of the, the things that I think is, is interesting is so um, prior to this, um, another um, few staff members at the ABMI who are no longer with us did essentially the same study, but focused on uh, the grassland and parkland region of Alberta. And they found very similar results as well. So again, they said, let's look at all these wetlands. Let's look at all their functional traits. Let's look at the surrounding land cover. And they found two general types that aligned with what we found in the boreal. So the wetlands were either dominated by native perennials with um, obligatory wetlands traits. So again, hydrophytes are more likely to be present. Um, or you had species or communities, sorry, that were composed of non-native annuals that had upland traits um, or surrounded by human footprint. So even though we're looking at two very different types of wetlands, the, the prairie pothole wetlands and the parkland wetlands are going to have different impacts to them compared to the boreal wetlands. In this kind of trait space that we're looking at, uh, we do see similar patterns in the types of wetlands that support uh, native hydrophyte species. So in summary, uh, um, I think this, this kind of functional diversity approach provides a really unique snapshot on the status of wetlands in Alberta's border forest. It gives us a bit more of an understanding of how communities can change in response to disturbance and invasion. So from a management standpoint, we can start to begin to think if there's two wetlands and development has to happen um, in that area, 
maybe if we look at the functional traits of those wetlands, we might be able to determine which one might be more resilient to invasion. Um, or maybe we're planning future parks, and that might also, again, help determine which wetlands we try and conserve um, because they might have a better chance um, kind of to um, exist from a long-term perspective instead of becoming quickly invaded by terrestrial invaders. And again, this is just, it's one aspect of wetland health. There are no shortage of characteristics that we can look at um, kind of wetland health at. But again, I think that's kind of a, a unique um, kind of aspect of wetlands that is worth studying more. So we have been doing some, some research since then. Um, we are doing lots of continuation of how functional traits can be used as indicators for environmental monitoring. So within the ABMI, there's been a few different papers look at um, how traits can be used as bioindicators potentially, or how we can use traits to assess the recovery of different types of uh, reclamation in like oil and gas well pad studies. So maybe, again, instead of saying that species richness has recovered as a result of reclamation, maybe it's the functional traits is what we're more interested in. Um, doesn't matter if it's 10 species or 15 species, but if that trait space has recovered, um, that's, that might be the more important thing from a long-term ecological health standpoint. And we're also starting to do a little bit of exploration into how we can do these types of analyses for other taxonomic groups. Um, so again, as I mentioned before, functional traits are not unique to plants. Um, we can look at mammals and bryophytes and lichens and all these other groups, they all have their own functional traits um, and they're probably all gonna tell us some interesting signals. So we have started a little bit of exploratory work for bryophytes and lichens in this regard. We're also doing a little bit of work on how to map these functional traits. So again, as I mentioned, we can analyze and we can model the relationships between functional traits and their environment. So why can't we make a model that predicts where they are then? Um, so this is, I believe, the uh, an early model looking at the distribution of perennial species within the province. Um, and again, we can figure out these relationships. Are perennials more likely to grow in certain habitat types? Are they gonna be more dominant in human footprint categories or different types of development? Um, and there's no shortage of different traits that we can look at um, and try and figure out you know, where are they distributed in the province and have some traits been impacted more or less due to um, anthropogenic disturbance. So I realized that this was a, a probably fairly dense and quick overview into the plant functional traits. Um, it's not a, a common topic that's out there, but um, this is part of the ABMI Wetland Atlas. So this was released a few months ago. Um, there's a lovely overview discussing the paper, um, kind of the highlights of, you know, the traits that were involved, a little bit more detail in some of the analyses. Um, and if you really want, the, the paper is available online as well. So if you're one of those people that really likes technical details, uh, the paper is out there as well. So with that, uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions that people might have.